I'm Smitha Milley. I'm a PhD student in the Computer Science Department at Berkeley. And this is Ravid Dotan. <laughs> She's in from the Philosophy Department at Berkeley. OK, great. So machine learning has many types of models. We have graphical models, decision trees, neural networks, SVMs. Nowadays, the discipline focuses most on neural networks, often referred to as deep learning. But it wasn't always this way. The discipline has undergone many shifts in which type of model is predominant. And these disciplinary shifts are often viewed as a kind of objective progress. However, we're going to argue that these disciplinary shifts, oh, this is, sorry, I was changing it on here. Okay, well, that's, here we go. However, we're going to argue that these disciplinary shifts are not objective, that when we favor a model type over another, we are making a value judgment. And furthermore, accuracy, which is often used to justify a disciplinary shift, is not value neutral. So to illustrate the points, we'll consider the rise of deep learning as a case study. A common explanation for the rise of deep learning is its success on a particular ImageNet class, uh, classification competition, the 2012 ImageNet competition. So before 2012, deep learning models were not very popular. However, in 2012, a deep learning model, AlexNet, did far better than any other model type in the 2012 competition. So by 2014, deep learning had not only taken over ImageNet, but was spreading to become predominant in machine learning at large. So the common story ends up being that ImageNet was a key exemplar for the potential of deep learning and triggered its rise in popularity. However, if we let the story stop there, we miss a lot of nuance. The fact that a deep learning model had much higher accuracy on 2012 ImageNet can't be the whole story, because deep learning models also had promising results in earlier competitions, and those did not trigger the same effect that ImageNet did. So it begs the question of why exactly ImageNet in particular had such an impact. So when we say that deep learning had higher accuracy than other models on ImageNet, we're actually implicitly assuming the concept of accuracy that's used on ImageNet which is accuracy on a very large scale data set. However, we shouldn't take this concept of accuracy for granted because it was actually furthered by ImageNet. The main predecessor to ImageNet is Pascal VOC, another image classification competition. And that competition actually only had 20 classes and 20K images compared to ImageNet's thousand classes and about 1.5 million images. And in fact, Jia Deng, who was the lead author of the paper introducing the ImageNet data set, said that when he was first presenting it, there were comments like, if you can't even do one object well, why would you do thousands or tens of thousands of objects? So a common belief was that you needed to do one class well before scaling to many. People were skeptical that ImageNet would be useful at all. However, after, oh, sorry, thanks. My bad. However, after ImageNet, the predominant intuition changed. People began to think that you could make progress simply by scaling up data sets and waiting for faster GPUs. And the paper detailing the model that won that 2012 challenge explicitly pushes forth this idea. Um, this is my <laughs> OK, there's quotes. This is a figure from OpenAI that compares the amount of compute power used to train neural networks before and after 2012. So before 2012, the amount of compute power is um, increasing in accordance with Moore's law, doubling at a two-year rate. After 2012, the amount of compute power used doubles every 3.4 months. Um, so the this, this shift to deep learning did not just happen because deep learning models received higher accuracy. The shift was also entangled with a movement to evaluating accuracy in data-rich and compute-rich environments. So when we say that deep learning is better because it's more accurate, accuracy is actually too coarse-grained. The concept of accuracy changed with the transition to deep learning. The concept of how we would make progress actually changed. And we'll now argue that this concept of accuracy is itself value-laden. Hi. Um, OK, so to recap what Smitha was saying, uh, when we say that deep learning is better because it is more accurate, we are really saying that it is better because it is more accurate in compute and data-rich environments. However, doing so implicitly promotes certain values. Yeah, OK. First, using a lot of data and compute power has environmental impacts. 
For example, a recent study found that the carbon footprint of training one large state-of-the-art deep learning model in natural language processing is equivalent to the carbon footprint left by, uh, well, three times the carbon footprint left by one average car over its lifetime. Second, evaluating accuracy in data and computed environments implicitly promotes centralization of power. To illustrate, I'll use the story of golden rice. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so some of you may know that there is currently a vitamin A deficiency crisis. Hundreds of thousands of people die or become blind of it every year, especially in poor parts of the world. One proposed line of action is to look into which crops that are indigenous to the relevant areas are rich in vitamin A and encourage locals to grow and consume them. Another proposed line of action is utilizing golden rice, a genetically modified brand of rice that contains a lot of, a lot of vitamin A. Kevin Elliott points out that using golden rice promotes centralization of power because it's gonna deepen the dependency on the Western companies that produce golden rice, as well as tools of Western agriculture that are likely to accompany it, like fertilizers. Similarly, in machine learning, the reliance on specialized tools needed to process a lot of data, such as GPUs, creates a dependency on the organizations that make and can afford them. Moreover, the large amount of data needed to run deep learning models is an entry barrier, since not everyone has access to enough data. Third, running models on large data sets requires the collection of a lot of data. When that data is about people, collecting it involves issues of privacy and political freedom. The connection between mass data collection, privacy, and political freedom was recently made by the UK House of Lords. In a report from 2009 on mass surveillance, they say that mass surveillance has the potential to erode privacy. Since privacy is essential to individual freedom, the erosion of privacy weakens the constitutional foundations on which democracy and good governance are based. Last, we should not take for granted that model types that are more accurate are better overall. Equating between accuracy and the superiority of model types means disfavoring other things we care about, such as interoperability and fairness. I'm gonna skip this slide. Um, and go to the last slide. So stepping back from the details of our argument, the question we raised is, what makes a model type better than others? And how do values figure in comparing between model types? Much of the talk has focused on deep learning, but deep learning is just an example. The general point is that favoring one model type over another is value-laden because the considerations we need to compare between model types are value-laden, and even accuracy is not neutral. So if you take one thing from this talk, let it be this. When we favor a model type, we're making a value judgment. Thank you.